if you go into a situation of curiosity without having the prejudice, without having the biases, or as little as possible, but we all have biases and everything, if we can diminish the biases, it's incredible because you see things that are not obvious. In the realm of innovation and strategy, there are few individuals who embodied the true spirit of transformation, possessing a unique blend of strategic prowess, unwavering determination, and a passion for creating lasting impact. Nuno Gonzalez Pedro, the co-founder of Chameleon and Strive Capital, epitomizes this rare breed of visionary leaders. Welcome to The 1% Project, where we delve into the minds of extraordinary individuals who have achieved remarkable success and made a significant impact in their fields. In this episode, we speak to Nuno, who has 25 plus years of experience in the technology sector. He has been an operator and entrepreneur a senior leader with McKinsey & Company, founded and developed two venture capital firms, having directly invested in three well-known unicorns and three decacons. He is also the co-founder and co-host of Tech Deciphered, a top 3% podcast globally. Join us in this part one of two-part series to listen to Nuno's reflections on his career, his unique perception of adversity and how he deals with it, his experiences of staying in more than 35 countries, his view on food as an art form, and much more. Get ready for an enlightening conversation that will leave you inspired, motivated, and armed with invaluable insights to unlock your own potential. Subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to it and sign up to 1% Projects Think Newsletter at 1%.live for curated content that adds value to your professional and personal development. Stay till the end, where I summarize the key takeaways from this conversation with Nuno. Welcome, Nuno, to The 1% Project. Thank you for having me, Pritish. How do you reflect on your career? I have a really strange career. I've been working now for almost 27 years. Many people would say at different careers. I try and compartmentalize it into really probably four stages. I'm an engineer by background, computer engineer, and started there. Became a product manager, so that's the beginning of my career. To be honest, the product management piece never really left me. We might come back to that later. Secondly, I was what we used to call a line manager, what we in Silicon Valley now call a growth operator. So someone who does a strategy, product, corporate development, business development. So organic and inorganic sources of, of growth, plus the strategy side as well. And I did a lot of really cool stuff around then. A couple of really big scale-ups, very proud of some of the things we did, learn how you take an organization from 10 to 1,000, which is pretty incredible. And then I had an intermezzo, which I'm not sure I qualify. It qualifies as like a career, but it was definitely six years of my life that were really vital in many ways, in which I was with McKinsey & Company in Asia Pacific. I was a senior expert and member of the Asia Pacific technology, media, and telecom leadership team. And I was based in Beijing, worked extensively across Asia. And then the last step of my career really has been as an entrepreneur and venture capital. I'm now working on my second VC firm and my third fund called Chameleon. I did another VC firm called Strive Capital, which I still am one of the managing partners of. And then I do a variety of other things on the side. I, I always make the joke I don't suffer from ADHD, I enjoy every minute of it. I have a podcast called Tech Deciphered with Bertrand Schmidt, who was the founder and former CEO of Annie. Uh, we do a variety of other things together. I'm also still an independent board member, a couple of companies and an advisor. So really four stages to my life and my career. I can maybe tell you why I had such a strange career in these four careers in one, quasi 27 years, but that's basically it. That's the sort of four epochs of my life. Brilliant. And I highly recommend the podcast. Definitely the links will be in the show notes. It's an amazing breakdown of how technology is evolving, especially in the Silicon Valley and what kind of impact it's bringing to the global audience. And we will dive into a number of things that you just talked about, but let's get into first and talk about adversity. You gave a famous talk about adversity, how it has impacted you and how you've grown out of it and what you've learned out of it. So tell us what happened in 2017 or what you realized in 2017 and how it has helped you evolve. Yeah, I mean, it was a particularly difficult year of my life, you know, year of my divorce. Funnily enough, I'm still very good friends with my ex-wife, but I'm Catholic. And so the divorce was a very traumatic experience. It was a very lengthy 
the process itself was very short, but the process by which we got to divorce was relatively lengthy and we were separated. And again, for a Catholic person, that was, that's a significant trauma and obviously not the objective of us getting married in the first place. And that's maybe the biggest thing that happened that year, but it was a variety of other things. I was having difficulties professionally and finding my next thing. I'd really worked on two funds with Strive and I was figuring out what was the next thing and joined a partnership that didn't quite work out nicely or as nicely as I thought it would in helping them create their own venture capital arm, really good people, but they weren't my people. And sort of that realization was also a very complex realization to me. So it was a year of really very complex things. I wouldn't say I had an alcohol issue, but I was certainly drinking way too much. I was realizing the effects of alcohol. I was, it's a, how it becomes a depressant issue, start consuming it very regularly, even if it's not very high quantities. So there was a lot of things that amplified it. And the funny thing is this sun that you'll see in the image today, which people are like, well, they, why isn't this guy taking the sun away? The sun is my life. As I live next to the ocean and one day I looked outside like it is today. Sunset is going to be probably in an hour or so. And I couldn't feel happiness. And that had never happened to me. This is a beautiful place. I'm next to the ocean. I'm five minutes walking from the ocean. I have a very blessed life in, in, in more ways than one. And I, I couldn't really compute it. It was like, there's something wrong with me. Am I depressed? What's going on? All these different layers of adversity, small ones and very large ones. I was pushed to leave my job with this partnership in a way, because in some ways they were pushing me to do something that I really didn't want to do with a construct that didn't really work for me. So all of this stuff happened at the same time. And at that moment in time, I decided that rejection and adversity in general happen all the time in our lives. They probably happen several times a day. We probably don't notice it. It's like you go and park your car and someone tells you you can't park here, or you go somewhere and people are like, you can't do that. Or, you know, you go to the bank and you ask for something they say no. So even in small mundane things, rejection and adversity happen all the time. And then sometimes we have bigger adversities. All of us have bigger adversities, some more than others, probably. And those adversities may be more traumatic. And the thing that I sort of kept coming back to, I've done a lot of coaching with entrepreneurs over the years, a little bit by accident. I'm an investor. And then I took a few independent board seats over the years and I hustled and I did all these things. And then some entrepreneurs really wanted to work with me individually, not for me to work with their companies and their startups and their, they wanted me to work with them. And when that happened, basically I started developing this methodology around how do you catalyze rejection and adversity, not just to withstand it, the whole notion of grit and resilience, which everyone talks about these days. That's cool. Gr grit and resilience is cool. And it's amazing that people can come out of difficult situations. Could we actually process rejection and adversity as a positive catalyst? So it's one step further. It's not just I need to get out of this and I need to, you know, get a ladder to get myself out of this hole that I'm in, et cetera. No, it's like, this is a trampoline. Can I hit it just right so that I come back faster and higher? So it's the other way around. How can I make this positive to me? And in some cases, it's very difficult. It could be like the death of a significant other, quasi-bankruptcy or even bankruptcy. It could be many things. But can you catalyze it positively? And the notion of it that I started evolving also in my coaching practice, I don't do much coaching anymore. Unfortunately and sadly, I love coaching, but because I just don't have the time and I'm so focused on Chameleon and what we're doing at Chameleon as a VC, but there's this important step of the methodology, which is it takes practice to deal with it. It's like athletes. Athletes are really good and they go to the Olympics because they practice a lot. They're not just good because they have natural talents, all of this stuff. Some of them do, some of them might not. They practice a lot at it. And so the notion is let's be athletes at rejection. Let's practice really a lot at it to process it. So once it happens, how do I process it? How do I process it positively? How do I come of it in a stronger way? This scenario of yours or this adversity also helped you look into how to slow down and probably intensify and focus. So how did that work out and what have you learned out of that? There's a number of hacks that I talk a little bit about in the methodology in the keynote that you mentioned, the rejection and adversity keynote. The core notion, and everyone has heard about this in some way, the notion of power of now, the book, the famous book, The Power of Now, the notion of living in the present rather than the future or the past. And, and unfortunately, people like us that work in the business world, sometimes that might work in startups, that might work in investment world or in corporations, we always have to anticipate the future. In some ways, we have to be a bit obsessed about the future 
And like the famous Andy Grove book talked about, only the paranoid survive. In some ways, you have to anticipate plan B, plan C. You have to figure through what are the scenarios that might happen to your market, to your industry, and all that. So living in the present is actually a very different thing. You also have to take information from the past. What happened to you before so that you don't repeat the same mistakes? So the notion of living in the present is not new. I'm not inventing it. I'm not coming to it. It's a notion of I am present and aware. And the reason why that matters is a couple of things. One, it takes away the anxiety of the future. The future, in many cases, creates anxiety. You don't want to have anxiety in your life. You want to plan. You want to be prepared, but you don't want to be anxious. Anxiety takes you from the present, but it's also putting you in a negative realm. A negative realm of something that didn't happen, might not even happen. And so you're just winding yourself up for something that doesn't really matter. And then obviously the past, it brings a couple of other negative things. It brings in traumas. It brings in your perception of how other people behave with you. It brings in a bunch of psychological issues like fundamental attribution error and a variety of other things that manifest themselves. So the ideal stage is for you to be in the present. Okay. And that's at a very micro level. It's internal. That, that, this is the complex part. It's not about you stopping to think about the future. You're not having budget planning discussions. It's not that. It's about, can you be fully present in all your interactions? Can you be fully present and aware once you tell yourself that you need the space to regain calm? So slowing down is about that. Slowing down is about finding that peace, finding that moment. And that is a very powerful state. Because once you're in that moment, in that zone of peace and slowness, you see things clearer. You see everything clearer. Actually, you even see the future clearer in some ways. I practice two sports. And since I was a kid, I've been told by my family and my parents, and it's probably true. I always had difficulty with my hands and doing stuff with my hands. And they always treated me as known as the smart guy, intelligent guy. So he does stuff and that's great. And so we, we allow him not to actually work with his hands. We'll do stuff for him, which is, by the way, not a great thing. If you have kids and, and they're not very good with their hands, emphasize the work rather than the outcome. Maybe the outcomes won't be great, but if they put the effort, that's great. And so I decided to go with two sports that are the opposite of my skills. I clearly have difficulties with anti coordination. So I race cars. And I play table tennis. There might be other sports that require a lot of hand eye coordination, but these two do require a lot of hand eye coordination. And one is semi life or death, the other one is a little bit less life or death, but it's much more micro. And in both sports, I notice the moment where I am the fastest in race car driving, the moments where I'm doing my movements in table tennis, my top spins, my undercuts, or my underspins, et cetera, in the best possible way, are the moments where I am fully in flow where I'm fully present and in some ways where I'm fully there and there isn't anything else. And everyone thought, oh, but race car driving must be so exciting. It's the opposite. There's an amazing documentary on Senna, obviously after his passing, which talks about this race in Monaco where he was leading and he had this stupid accident. Everyone was like, that is leading by, I don't know, 30 something seconds from second place, which is mm. silly. And he had an accident and he described it by saying, there were laps, a bunch of laps I don't remember. And then there was a moment that I had the thought and I hit the wall. So what effectively happened is he got out of flow. He was in flow for a bunch of laps. He doesn't remember them. He was going faster and faster and faster. And at a certain point in time, something happened in his head that popped up a movement and it took him out of flow and he just hit a wall. And that's what happens in our lives. We have too many distractions. We have too many things being thrown at us. We have messaging apps everywhere. We have email. It's very difficult to be in a state where you say, okay, I'm going to be here and have this conversation with Patish, or I'm going to be here and have this conversation with my colleague, or I'm going to be here and listen to this startup, which is the 10th startup I'm listening to this week. So all of that's very complex, but that act of presence and slowness is very important. It's also true that in race car driving and in table tennis, when you start th seeing things a bit slower, the ball is coming to you slower in some ways. The, by the way, the ball is not, but in your brain is processing it slower for some reason, you're playing better or you're racing better. You're seeing things more clearly. And that's exactly what that slowness means. It's not about Dolce Far and Niente and we don't have active lives you don't, and we don't work 67 hour weeks. That's not it. It's about having these states as much as possible, a slowness of awareness of presence. The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, that's the book you were referring to, is yes. brilliant. It's, I've read it so many times. 
and I recommend everybody to read it. It's a very thin, simple book, but it conceptually gives you an idea that how important is the power of now. And I don't think we can explain it as much as we may want, but reading the book helps. And obviously, he has a great YouTube channel as well. You have lived and worked in 35 countries, and that would have been an experience. Double click on that. How has that shaped you? What have you learned and what have you taken away from the different countries? Two aspects to it. One is, and I don't know why this happened to me, but I did my first trip to the Benelux. So this is like Germany, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Belgium, and France. That's, that's the Benelux. And, you know, my parents were quite liberal. So I went into places that I shouldn't have. I was five. I went into places that shall not be named certain streets in Amsterdam certain places that which shows in Paris. I was five again that I probably shouldn't have gone into, but this is Europe. And our tour guide was more than shocked that my parents were like, whatever. And particularly my mother is very liberal like that. And at the end of the trip, I, we went back to Portugal and they're like, so what was your favorite thing? And they were expecting some of these things like the street in Amsterdam or whatever, the show in Paris or whatever. And I was like, I really like Cologne in Germany. And they're like, oh. Okay. <laughs> Why? <laughs> not, not very obvious. They have a beautiful cathedral. Colma has a beautiful cathedral, but it's not a very obvious place to mention after this trip. And I was like, because things work. And at the moment where they were like, you know, why there's this, there's this notion of this kid is different. He's a bit, he's Portuguese, but he's in Latin, but he's. A bit Germanic, but Anglo-Saxon captures it better, a bit in the middle. In some ways, that was my first instructional piece of my life. As I grew up, I was subject to a lot of different cultures. My parents would travel with me in summer. Funnily enough, sister lives abroad, lives in Germany. I live in the U.S. and I've lived all over, as you were mentioning. My parents have never lived abroad. My father passed away a couple of years back, but they never lived abroad, which is really interesting. I think there was an openness to the world that my parents gave me, particularly my mother, this notion of... She never treated me like a kid. She always talked to me like I was an adult. The language she would use, the way she would talk to me, she never treated me like I was a kid. And that in some ways edified my curiosity of the world, which probably leads me to, to me being a venture capitalist. I'm curious about the world. I'm generally curious. And if you go generally curious into the world with relatively low prejudice, which doesn't mean you don't have your moral standards and your ethics and all that stuff. As I said, I'm Catholic. There is a certain doctrine and moral that I abide by, et cetera. But if you go into a situation of curiosity without having the prejudice, without having the biases, or as little as possible, but we all have biases and everything. If we can diminish the biases, it's incredible because you see things that are not obvious. And you mentioned the 35 countries that either I lived in or that I worked in. Every country had something to tell me. I remember working in Bangladesh in Dhaka, which is not a very obvious place for you to have great eureka moments if you are in tech, for example. But there were great eureka moments for me. I remember working with a particular client there and the quality of the guys, in particular the junior guys on the team, was like silly, silly high. They were just so smart. And I was like, here we are, a country that we have at least eight brownouts a day. Stuff goes up and down and then the electricity comes back up. A country that has suffered, that suffered a civil war, that you drive on the streets or you walk on the streets and you see the effects, people that are mutilated systematically, begging or having difficulties. You see that and then you see talent and you're like, wow, it's, irre it's irrelevant. And that realization is very profound because it means that, for example, in emerging markets, it's very clear. It was very clear to me for many years. Many people say that about me, that I see things five to 10 years before they sort of happened. It was very clear to me that there was going to be huge leapfrogging in many emerging markets, that many emerging markets were going to be really just going over many other Western markets or developed markets, if we want to call them like that, just because they didn't have the infrastructure, but they also didn't have the legacy. And because of that, there was no other way to go. You don't talk about countries like this, like mobile first, right? They are mobile first. Like mm. India, they have to be because the internet infrastructure didn't really percolate through fixed. So it had to be mobile. And, and that is what I find is amazing. This multiculturality, how people deal with you, how they interact, you know, why you have a card in your hand and you give it with the two hands when you're meeting a Japanese business partner, you know, why you should bring business cards to a meeting with a Japanese partner. 
or potential Japanese partner. There's all these little things that matter because at the end of the day, it's all about creating empathy and interaction. And a lot of people would say, oh, it's hacks and cool. You can use it as hacks. You can use it as whatever. I believe in authenticity. So creating an authenticity that sort of mirrors or at least empathizes with the culture that you're interacting with is an incredibly powerful way. It's incredible to do business. It's incredible to create friendships. It's incredible to bridge the world. And the most interesting thing to me, I remember someone telling me, it wasn't me, I didn't come up with this. I was in a taxi cab, I swear to you, <laughs> in Southeast Asia, I don't recall it exactly where. I either was in Singapore or I was in Malaysia. And the guy in the taxi cab that was driving me, this wasn't Uber or whatever, this was just the guy in the taxi cab, his English was a bit broken. He just turned to me and he said, the world would be a much better place if people saw the world like you do. And I was like, what, 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 I have to process this for a sec. Very flattering, of course, very flattering, but let me process this. And what he was saying is, if the world was subject to tremendous, to almost like forced empathy, where you need to interact in those environments, you need to live there, you need to work there, you need to actually do business there. People would understand that at the end, they were sort of all very similar. We have different cultural backgrounds. We have different views of family, et cetera, but we're all very similar. We just have little differences that come from culture, from language, from many years of history, from background, et cetera. And that taxi cab driver, I'll never forget what he said. It's like, the world would be a better place. The world would be a better place. That's what we're missing sometimes, that multicultural exchange. You go to a guy on Sand Hill Road, which is where all VCs here are in Silicon Valley. And yeah, of course, yeah, I've done a bunch of business in Asia and whatever. Yeah, so what sort of business did you do? So what propels you to have these discussions? We, we talk about China today. China is obviously in the news and without wanting to go one way or the other, I loved my time in China. It was profound. It, was, it changed my life in many ways. People have so many misconceptions on the Chinese. I make this comment once in a while. The average Chinese is much more similar to the average American than people think. This notion of capitalism, of making its work, of making money, of going to the next level is actually relatively embedded in Chinese society. There's aspects of Chinese society that are very different. The notion of family is very different. In some ways, more positive to me than in some cases, certainly the coasts of the U.S. But there's something about this that people miss. And then they look at the other guys. There, this, there's this analogy in cars and in racing as well, which is, it's actually good to know there's another person in, the, in that car. It's not you and a car. On the other side, it's you and a person. That creates more empathy. It creates sort of an attitude of a bit more respect. It doesn't mean that you're not trying to overtake them, but it's, in some ways that's it. We talk about China and Chinese, for example, sometimes in the U.S. like it's something. It's not something. It's a bunch of people, individuals. And that's what we need to look at. Two observations. The realizations that you had in Dhaka makes us, people like you and me, to understand how privileged we are, how we were born at the right place at the right time, got the right opportunities. And the second is when you looked at all of these scenarios and you talked about in Japan and in China as well, you give a business card with two hands and people call it a hack, which is a misrepresentation of what is actually culture and appreciation of that. If it is communicated in a way that this is a culture and somebody appreciates your culture, there is much more empathy, as you mentioned, much more collaboration. I feel that hack is a much abused word for things where we should actually use the literal understanding of the concept. I agree. And I'm a hacker, just to be clear. So I do use things in my life as hacks and then I sometimes transform systems or not. But I agree with you. It's an understanding of culture. It's an empathy that comes from understanding that people are different and their culture in many ways makes a lot of sense as well. And you just need to understand what that brings to the table and that interaction. Before we get into Chameleon, we definitely have to talk about your love for food, your restaurant list. How did that happen and how has that influenced you? I'm a nerd. When I get into something, I really get into something. So I go deep. That's for me the definition of being a nerd. You go deep into whatever you get excited about. And food is a passion. I love eating. I loved eating too much. I've lost 60 kilograms, 130 pounds over a period of years. Actually, my, the way I look has changed dramatically. And I'm very thankful for that. But I love food. And what started happening was I started, I, I remember the, one of the first times I recall going to a Michelin star restaurant. It was a three-star Michelin star restaurant. One of, one of only two in London at that 
point in time was Gordon Ramsay at Royal Hospital Road, the one that made Gordon Ramsay famous. I was like, there's something about this that's different. It's a Michelin star experience. It doesn't need to be necessarily Michelin star experience. I love holes in the wall, bars, restaurants, food in the middle of the street. I love food, any type of food. The specificity of these type of higher end experiences is I started realizing there's probably, in my opinion, they are the highest form of art because it's like there's a mise-en-scene, there's like a, there's the aspect of the room, there's the aspect of the plates and everything that gets put together. There's the mise-en-scene of people, the acting of the servers and the waiters bringing things to you and the way they bring it to you, the way they explain it, the way they serve you. There's then the smell of the food, there's the epic of the food and the form of the food, and then there's the taste of the food. And if you think about art forms, this is a pretty complete art form because sensory-wise, you're touching almost all senses. Maybe hearing is the one that's a little bit lighter, but even in hearing, there could be background music, there's sound, there's motions of sound, etc. And so for me, that's what got me into it. And so I started looking at it as art and started trying to empathize with the people that are in the kitchen that work ridiculous amount of hours and really hard and the chefs and everyone, so chefs, brigades, etc., as artists. And so if they're artists, you have to treat them like that. You have to interact with them like that. You have to touch their lives like that. And you have to ask them about their lives. And there's something a friend of mine, an old friend of mine used to say about me that I'm very good at natural stupidity. <laughs> I took it as a compliment. I've, and I've used that sentence all the time in the past. I ask questions which might seem a bit idiotic, <laughs> but in retrospect, are really good questions that people really then... And so I started doing that with chefs. People would bring me... There, there's this rule that many people follow, which is never dine alone. I don't agree with that. I Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I do. So it depends on the circumstance, et cetera. But because of that, I started getting access to kitchens. People would bring me to take a photo with the chef, you don't see the kitchen. And I would talk to them and they'd give me the sign, copy the menu, and we take all these things. And so what started happening was I had this idea to create a list because I'm so nerd, I need to have a list. So I created a list of all the Michelin star restaurants that I've been to for strength then. So it's not the San Pellegrino list, it's the Nuno list, which are the best restaurants that I've been to that are Michelin star. That's it. And I go through the list. I reevaluate things sometimes because, you know, you sort of have an effect on it the night of or the day of, and then you, you have to ponder right. it on it again and talk about it. I made chefs cry because they went number one on the list or because they went very high on the list. Uh, I've had some really incredible experiences with people, but there's always a tremendous amount of respect. For me, they're fundamentally artists. There's a lot of sweat in what they do, but they are artists. And, and that's how Al that list was started. I have friends now that Ask me for tips. I haven't really shared the list. I haven't figured out the right way to share the list yet. I'm probably going to do some experimentation with TikTok and a few other platforms to see how to do that. But people ask me for advice. People have actually asked me for advice and said they would pay me, which is very flattering for the advice, just for the advice. And it's for me, it's, it's, it's second nature. It's not like I'm doing this for a thing. It's not like I'm going to make money out of this. It's a thing. It's just my own way of processing things. As I said, I'm a bit nerdy like that. Hope you enjoyed the conversation with Nuno. Here are the key takeaways from this conversation. Number one, embracing and catalyzing rejection and adversity can lead to personal growth and resilience. Instead of solely focusing on enduring and overcoming difficult situations, one should perceive rejection and adversity as positive catalysts. By actively processing and practicing how to navigate these challenges, individuals can develop the ability to extract valuable lessons, bounce back stronger, and view adversity as an opportunity for personal and professional transformation. Number two, by intentionally slowing down and embracing a state of slowness, individuals can find peace and regain a sense of calm, which enables clearer thinking, heightened awareness, and improved decision making. And number three, Embracing cultural diversity and approaching the world with genuine curiosity and empathy leads to a deeper understanding of others, break down barriers, and pave the way for meaningful connections and collaborations across different cultures and backgrounds. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone who will find it valuable. For any recommendations and feedback, you can drop me a line at 
pratish at the rate 1%.life. Until next time.